Hey everybody, it is Nathan Seelove with a long coming edition of Autism Actually Speaking. Today I'm going to be talking about a topic that I've been planning on talking about for a year and a half. Applied Behavioral Analysis. Applied Behavioral Analysis is considered very controversial within the autism community. And for really good reasons. There is certainly no shortage of videos out there from autistic YouTubers discussing some of the really bad parts of applied behavioral analysis. Now, I personally have never been put through it, but I do know a lot of people in my personal life that have. I've also spent a long time reading about this, and I think we need to talk about it. Now, I want to make one thing clear before we get started. I understand that there might be some parents that are watching that might have put their kids through applied behavioral analysis. I understand that for some parents that might be watching, it might have actually seemed like it was a success for their child. And if you fall under that category, I would encourage you to try to approach this video with an open mind. I will be making judgments in this video, but it is primarily going to be geared towards the people behind ABA rather than parents who have participated in it. So I'm going to start off by steelmanning the argument, or presenting the argument in favor of ABA in the best possible way. Then I'm going to discuss the history of ABA, and then we're going to examine what the main problems are with it. So first off, what actually is Applied Behavioral Analysis, or ABA? From the Autism Speaks website, ABA therapy applies our understanding of how behavior works to real situations. The goal is to increase behaviors that are helpful and decrease behaviors that are harmful or affect learning. The primary method through doing this is through classical conditioning. A lot of you might already be familiar with that term. Classical conditioning comes from Pavlovian psychology. In Pavlovian psychology, you have positive and negative reinforcement. Pavlov applied positive and negative reinforcement to both children and to animals, specifically dogs. Positive reinforcement is actually something that I use primarily with my own service dog. So in the context of that, positive reinforcement is when a reward is given when the desired behavior is done. For example, I tell my dog Blake to sit, and she sits, therefore I give her a treat. Meaning that the only consequence of not sitting is that she doesn't get the treat. Negative reinforcement is applying a punishment when an undesirable behavior is performed. Now, this is not something that I do with my dog, to be clear. But if I did, it would look something like, I tell her to sit, she doesn't sit, so I smack her in the face. Again, not something I do with her. The idea behind positive and negative reinforcement is that if you can condition the person or the animal to associate good things with an action or bad things with an action, then it makes them more likely to want to do the good things and to not do the bad things. So this brings us back to applied behavioral analysis. There's a really good reason why I don't use negative reinforcement on my dog. And that's because negative reinforcement can damage the bond between myself and my dog. And in a lot of ways, it works similarly when it comes to children, which is why, to ABA's credit, a lot of its modern day practices have gone away from the negative reinforcement and towards the positive reinforcement. Meaning that the primary focus of ABA nowadays is on that positive reinforcement. You are trying to encourage certain behaviors, which means that the behaviors that you're trying to discourage, the consequence of those behaviors is that you do not get the reward. And at face value, that might make a certain amount of sense to a lot of people for autism. As I've said on this channel before, there are some behaviors that those of us in the autism spectrum do that are objectively destructive. For example, when I was a kid, I would chew on my shirt, which was not only gross, but it would destroy perfectly good shirts. Sometimes you might even have more intensive behaviors, such as self-harming behaviors. If a child is hurting themselves, you want them to not be hurting themselves. And you can find multiple studies that do show that applied behavioral analysis is pretty effective at changing behaviors. And I think a lot of reasonable people could make the argument that if applied behavioral analysis is primarily positive reinforcement, and positive reinforcement, as we know, does tend to strengthen bonds, and if it is effective at actually alleviating specific behaviors or preventing specific behaviors, then what's the issue? 
And that brings us to the history of ABA. Applied Behavioral Analysis was originally created by a man named Dr. Ivar Lobos. He's a doctor, a Norwegian psychologist. Sounds like a stand-up guy. Wait a minute, I feel like I've heard that name before. Oh yeah, that's because he's the guy that created gay conversion therapy. A practice that is opposed by the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, the American Academy of Family Physicians, the American Academy of Nursing, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Association of Sexuality Educators, Counselors, and Therapists, the American Counseling Association, the American Group Psychotherapy Association, the American Medical Association, the American Medical Student Association, the American Mental Health Counselors Association, the American Psychological Association, the American Psychoanalytical Association, the American Psychiatric Association, the American School Counselor Association, the Association of Christian Counselors, the Australian New Zealand Professional Association for Transgender Health, the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, the British Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Psychotherapies, the British Psychoanalytical Council, the British Psychological Society, the Canadian Association for Social Work Education, the Canadian Association of Social Workers, the Canadian Psychiatric Association, the Clinical Social Work Association, the College of Registered Psychotherapists of Ontario, the College of Sex and Relationship Therapists, the International Federation of Social Workers, the National Association for Children's Behavioral Health, the National Association of School Psychologists, the National Coalition for Mental Health Recovery, the National Counseling Society, the NHS England, the NHS Scotland, the Royal College of General Practitioners, the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, the Substance Abuse and Medical Health Services Administration, the UK Council for Psychotherapy, and the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. So yeah, that's the guy that created Applied Behavioral Analysis. So not off to a good start. But maybe that was just a dud. Maybe trying to change who people actually are is not what he wants to be remembered for. Let's ask the man himself. I'd like to be remembered as one who worked to free those whose minds enslaved them, and as a person who challenged the notion that variables that we used to be considered to be stable and unchanging, like IQ and autism, aren't really as unchanging as many had thought them to be. Okay, so he is trying to change him. And he also thinks that we're enslaved by our minds. But as we have said before, there are some behaviors from people on the autism spectrum that can be destructive, like self-harming behaviors. And that puts people in pain. And we want to keep kids from feeling pain, right? Except one of his methods for preventing these behaviors was electroshock therapy. In fact, the Lova Center website today still justifies it. Quote, while the use of electroshock on individuals with intellectual delay issues may seem inhumane or archaic, its effectiveness in changing behavior could not be disputed. At the time, it was considered cutting edge work and changed the direction of treatment. The shift in treatment from a Freudian theory-based practice to one based solely on empirical evaluations and reliable data created what today is known as applied behavioral analysis. So the original iteration of applied behavioral analysis was electroshock therapy. The people that came up with this thought it was a good idea to shock children. So Lobos would sometimes lay out this electric tarp that ch children would walk on, and whenever they would exhibit behaviors like stimming, like hand flapping that were associated with autism, he would shock them. And the reason why he would shock them when they would exhibit behaviors such as hand flapping and other types of stims was because he rationalized that it seems that these children would perform these behaviors during times in which they were stressed, to which he thought, Oh, well that must mean that those behaviors are causing the stress. Instead of considering the possibility that, I don't know, they're a response to the stress? Those are ways of self-regulating? So, to be clear, this guy would shock children, autistic children, when they would be trying to self-regulate themselves through stems such as hand flapping, and he thought, that that was the way of helping them. And the sad thing is, it seemed effective because it succeeded in reducing the behaviors. And that starts to lead us into the essential problems with applied behavioral analysis. The biggest problem is, and I, I need you all to understand this, Lovas was an idiot. Whenever any child does a behavior, especially an autistic child, 
it is in response to something that is causing that behavior. So when Lovas would shock autistic children for doing stuff like hand flapping, not only would that cause them pain, but it would also take away a method that the children had for self-regulating. They would associate the shock with the hand flapping, which is something that they had originally used to try to relieve their stress. But it was viewed as successful because you were no longer seeing the behavior, but something was causing the behavior. So even though applied behavioral analysis has in many ways moved away from the negative reinforcement and away from the electroshock therapy, the stated goal is still not one that should necessarily be desirable. Behavior is a form of communication. And for many autistics who struggle with communication in the first place, sometimes that's their only method of communicating when they're feeling stress. And focusing more on taking that behavior away, rather than trying to figure out what's causing it and potentially alleviating it, is only helping the people around the child who take care of the child not the child themselves. It's only isolating them, putting them into their own world. Now, I mentioned earlier that Lovas was also the guy that created gay conversion therapy. And I don't want to say that those are comparable in every way, but there are absolutely some similarities. Both are based off classical conditioning, and both also have a similar justification. Lovas believed that by preventing children from acting autistic, that he was helping them because the world would never accept them as they are. He needed to try to shape them to act as normal as possible, which was a very similar justification that he gave for gay conversion therapy. His justification was that nobody would ever accept gay kids. Therefore, you need to shape that behavior out of them. Now, the other problem is that ABA is considered such a widely accepted type of therapy that in some places in the United States, the only way that you can get any type of insurance coverage to help with therapy associated with autism is through a licensed ABA therapist. One of the things that I have heard about, and I don't have any official documentation of this, this is just based off of either personal conversations that I've had or personal conversations that people that I know have had with licensed ABA therapists, is that there's sometimes a practice where a licensed ABA therapist doesn't actually practice ABA, they do other things that are actually more helpful. But they still keep that licensure in order to actually get insurance coverage. Now, I don't wanna to talk too much about that because I don't know how widespread that is, but I do know that there are cases of that. Now, I do just want to reiterate that there are some behaviors that autism can cause that are objectively destructive that we probably do want to prevent, but there are better ways of doing it. The first step should always be to try to understand what is causing the behavior. Why is an autistic child acting up? Why are they self-harming? If they're self-harming, it's probably because they're so desperate to communicate, to get your attention, that that's the only way that they know how to. Or if it's a destructive stim behavior, like with my case where I was chewing my shirt, then there are ways of finding less destructive stim behaviors. For example, what my parents did was they had there be a special accommodation for me where I could chew gum in class. That stopped me from chewing my shirt because I was able to stem in a way that was much less destructive. Again, if you're a parent that is using or has ever used applied behavioral analysis, I don't want you to feel like I'm judging you. It probably seems like the best option. You probably had a lot of people telling you that this is how you prevent these behaviors. And not only that, but you might have had no choice because of insurance coverage. But I really hope that you reconsider after watching this video. We really need to get away from this behavior-based focus on therapy and more towards this understanding what causes the behaviors. I know way too many people, way too many adults on the spectrum, that are still feeling the psychological trauma from instances of applied behavioral analysis in their childhood, even when it wasn't negative reinforcement, even when it was the best version of what ABA claims to be. It still had harmful effects because it told them that who you are is not right and it has to change. It doesn't matter what's causing those behaviors. It doesn't matter that you're trying to communicate. 
It just matters the performance that you're putting on for the rest of us. So maybe Lovas did have a point when he said that the world as it is would not accept autistic behavior. That might be an unfortunate truth, but it doesn't have to be that way. It seems to me like the solution to a world that doesn't accept a person is to change that world with activism, with advocacy. And that should be the real prescription. That should be the real behavioral analysis. Well, that's today's video. Thank you all for watching. I am really sorry that it took me so long to make this video. I posted a video earlier talking about how I had a year and a half from hell and explaining why it is I've been really inactive on YouTube. So if you, you're interested in that, check that out. I do hope to start making videos again. I don't know how regularly they're gonna be, but, but I have missed this. So if you liked this video, please give it a like or a share. And if you want to see future videos, be sure to subscribe and hit that notification button so you can see when I post new content. And remember, if you're obsessed with globes, you might be autistic.